you know, I mentioned China. Um, China had um, 800 million people that were pulled out of poverty in a matter of decades. I mean, it's the greatest transformation away from poverty in human history. But then there's parts of the world that didn't see this. In fact, you know, the city that I mentioned that I grew up in has been left to rot for decades now. Uh, and it's been a long time. And um, supply chains are not going to go back to cities in the United States like Baltimore and Flint, Michigan, cities in Europe. And now actually you're starting to see this rot happening in, in places in Asia and other countries as well. So uh, globalization and supply chains have become great from an aggregate standpoint, but very imbalanced when it comes to supply and demand benefits across society. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal, and today I got with me Dr. Jack Buffington from the University of Denver, where he is an assistant professor of supply chain management. Professor Buffington recently published an intriguing book called Reinventing the Supply Chain, a 21st century covenant with America. On 230 pages, he discusses how modern supply chains link up to create the physical world of goods that we see around us, he explains how America lost supply chain leadership, why this came with the industrialization, and um, what we what can be expected in the months and years um, ahead in this new world of uh, of fractured globalization. Professor Buffington, Jack, welcome to the show. Thanks, Pascal. Nice to be here. Well, thanks for taking the time. Uh, I really enjoyed reading your book. And um, let's maybe clear up the first question first. What exactly is a supply chain? Because we take them for granted, but they're not, right? What is a supply chain? Yeah, at its most basic element, as you would suspect, supply chains are a system with the goal to balance supply and demand. Now, understanding that and understanding over most of human history, you know, human civilization has been around for six, 8,000 years. Um, there's always been a shortage of supply and there's never been enough demand. Um, so there's never enough food. Um, economic growth was was impacted. Population growth was impacted. And then at the end of the 19th century was the proliferation and growth of fossil fuels. Uh, and fossil fuels was this dense energy source that enabled mass production of goods, mass uh, transportation of goods. And so it would take a couple of decades to get through depressions and wars and everything like that for the commercial supply chain to really begin in the United States after World War II. Um, and actually at that point in time was the first time in human history where supply was able to achieve demand. Actually, even beyond that to supply would exceed demand. And then we would create this discipline called marketing, which would push consumers to buy more to meet supply. Then what would happen is the supply chains expanded into Europe, into Japan over the middle and the end of the 20th century. And then the big change to supply chain happened at the beginning of the 21st century when the most populous nation in the world, China, entered the WTO. And now all of a sudden we had this global supply chain where there was a possibility of production all over the world. And that glorious time lasted for about 20 years. And then all of a sudden, we're, we're starting to see now as a breakdown of globalization and supply chain for a couple of reasons. One is geopolitics, which I know you know very well. And then the second one has to do with, through all the industrialization of these countries, you started to see a population decline because people used to live in the country. Now everybody moves into the cities where kids are expensive. And big countries like China and Germany and Korea and Japan started to see a decrease in their population. So now we have the complete opposite of what we had for most of human history. So for most of human history, we had not enough supply to meet demand. And now today we have this problem that's just very recent where we have a lot of supply and a flat or decreasing demand. Yeah, and let me maybe also tell everybody that you got in touch with me when you heard me talk about oversupply with which Janet Yellen complains about with China. And right. this is yeah, this struck me as so weird. And it I think I think it 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 struck a nerve with you. 
I would like to go there in the second half of the of the interview, and we will discuss it in detail. But let's focus a little bit on your book because um, I would like everybody to understand where where you're coming from. So, because supply chain is a technical issue, right? It's it's how how different goods. And the, the the moving of these goods links up in order to create the physical reality around us, like with goods and things and stuffs and and, and shiny, uh, which we all like. Um, can you tell us where's your interest for that coming from, and what are what are the main arguments of the book? Yeah, it, it may be hard for you to believe this, but my interest and passion around supply chain became when I was born, um, because I was actually born in uh, the city of Baltimore, Maryland which uh, if you and your, your viewers are not familiar with, was one of the key hubs of industrialization in the United States. Baltimore had the largest steel mill, large shipyard, uh, port city that was very important in the industrialization in the United States. So I grew up in the 70s and 80s. And um, like most people who lived in Baltimore who could have gotten out of the city, my family did. Um, but I spent every weekend in the city because my mom worked there. And I saw this deindustrialization happen as a young kid. And I didn't know quite what it meant, but I saw the city begin to rot. And I saw this happen for a long period of time. And it was really unsettling to me because I didn't really understand what the supply chain was. And I didn't want to work in the field because my family lost all its blue collar jobs. So I went to college, went into white collar work. Um, eventually I got back into manufacturing and supply chain. It was almost like I was destined to be a part of this. So I had this um, family history about what happened to my family and my city. And then I started to run large supply chains. In fact, you know, I ran logistics for the world's largest brewery. I ran massive facilities. And I saw that supply chain is this field of problem solving. But as any corporation is responsible for, we're responsible for solving problems for our shareholders and our consumers. And I started to think about this and thought that that was imbalanced across the world because we have this big world right now where in some parts of the world, supply chain satisfies consumers and, and shareholders. In other parts of the world, you see growth in production and you see you know, impacts, improvements to society. You know, I mentioned China. Um, China had um, 800 million people that were pulled out of poverty in a matter of decades. I mean, it's the greatest transformation away from poverty in human history. But then there's parts of the world that didn't see this. In fact, you know, the city that I mentioned that I grew up in has been left to rot for decades now. Uh, and it's been a long time. And um, supply chains are not going to go back to cities in the United States like Baltimore and Flint, Michigan, cities in Europe. And now actually you're starting to see this rot happening in, in places in Asia and other countries as well. So uh, globalization and supply chains have become great from an aggregate standpoint, but very imbalanced when it comes to supply and demand benefits across society. Why, why is it that you link the industrialization to supply chains or you 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 argue that the industrialization is a supply chain issue because to me the industrialization is like these these political decisions to basically in you know produce abroad instead of producing at home uh why why do you what's the supply chain doing there well it's well, it's, it's interesting i think this goes into the differences between our backgrounds so I look at industrialization as this balancing of supply and demand. And if you look at how economic growth happened, it threw, grew through this multiplier effect through industrialization where increased production led to improvement in jobs, which led to higher incomes, which led to demand you know, creation, which happened in the early uh, 20th century in the United States through you know, Henry Ford's Model T and things like yeah, that. Yeah, a, a Keynesian. That's a Keynesian outlook on how the economy works, right? Yeah. Correct, yeah. And supply chain in that in that model takes on which role in order to, to define whether a place is going to develop or deindustrialize? Right. So in the United States, it started off through, you know, the creation of, of this pent up demand that, you know, existed for decades after, you know, through two world wars and one depression. Um, and so the United States had was this industrial power that was used to win World War II. 
And in order for, you know, there were some economists who believed that after World War II, the United States was going to move into a big depression because all the production was made for, for wars and not for industry. So what happened was there was a pivot towards a consumer-based um, supply chain, which is, you know, the model that exists in the United States today that was very successful in the middle of the 20th century until the imbalance occurred through globalization and jobs moved to countries where it was cheaper to make things. One of the things that we see time and again as countries develop is how they go from an export-oriented growth model because you have cheap labor, so you export goods and then and then benefit from the rent toward once you're once you have built up your middle class toward like a, a consumer-led uh, growth model where your consumer can sustain and can can actually. Uh, uh, suck up a lot of the of the products that you can produce yourself, at least in a in a perfect world. I mean, in a, in a simple world, um, of course, there's it's always porous and and it's different for every nation. But there is a, a shift from export led to uh, consumer led. Now, does the supply chain itself then also have to adapt towards this change or not? No, the supply chain doesn't have to adapt to it because what happened is is that these companies started off as um, based on a certain country, and then they became multinational where they possess no sovereignty at all, right? And so, you know, big companies, um, they look at the world as an optimization scheme, as opposed to, I think the challenge that exists in any country is that whole goal of balancing supply and demand. Because if you don't properly balance supply and demand, you don't create that economic multiplier effect. I see. Like, but do you have an example for an for an poorly managed supply and demand like model that, that a historical one? Yeah, I think. I mean, one one thing that I've been talking about for a while. When I mentioned to you that what's happened with the breakdown of supply chains has been happening has been in the works for decades now. Um, and it, you know, a poorly balanced supply chain is um, not optimizing the whole production process to become efficient because with a global, um, you know, with a global workforce and cheap transportation, you know, it only costs about 70 cents to ship a pair of jeans from Bangladesh to the United States. So these big multinational companies didn't have to focus on optimization because they could just lean on cheap labor in other countries and uh, effective logistics. And so what happened is uh, these country, these companies that would focus on efficiency and optimization and everything that supply chain was founded on started to focus on just easy decisions to move it to other countries because it was so cheap to do things in a world that where there's so much available labor. But there's at the same time, there's a, a tendency of these big corporations to try to control as much as possible of the supply chain, right? From the labor law standards in the in the in cheap cheap labor countries all the way to uh, at which price everything is sold in, in, in a country, right? Is is this about correct or do do no. the 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 big clothing companies, um, you know, the I mean I think clothing is probably the best example, you know. Companies like that make your jeans, that make your shoes, um, they don't have to control the supply chain. Um, in fact, there's so much of the supply chain that they don't understand. Um, you know, a good example, if I could give you from a globalization standpoint, I'm not sure if you saw this, it happened like four or five months ago, but um, Bangladesh is, is one of the largest producers of clothing and the workers went on strike um, and the government actually stop the strike. Uh, and so I think people would look at that and blame the government for it and not blame Nike and all these clothing companies. But in reality, it's the government that was trying to save the jobs from going to some other country where if they raise the wages in Bangladesh, they would move to Ecuador or something like that. So the, the, the clothing manufacturers that you're wearing or I'm wearing, they don't control the supply chain itself. Um, in fact, um, there, there's really um, significant divisions between them and the companies that are making the garments or making the shoes or the electronics. So it is uh, it, it is market forces that then basically incentivize even governments in uh, 
in cheap labor countries to keep it that way, even though that might be hurtful to their local labor force. Exactly. And to, and to quote Janet Yellen, so you, you, since you brought her name up already, you know, she, she categorizes this as a race to the bottom. Um, so there's always some country because, I mean, there's 8 billion people on the planet. There's a couple hundred million um, available workers, whereas if one country like China, if their, their wages start to go up, it's easy for um, supply chains to move commodity goods to another nation. Same thing with environmental loss. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. I'll, um, there's a, there's a um, importer of backpacks in the United States uh, that was talking to um, a, a manufacturer in India because some of the labor laws in one of the countries they're doing business with was getting quite complicated. And when they talked to India about making backpacks for the United States, the manufacturer said, why would I wanna make backpacks for you? when they have to worry about environmental laws and all these other things, when they can just sell them in my country and not have to worry about it. So, you know, you have this disconnect between the manufacturers and the suppliers that really gets down to, you know, what is the cheapest way of doing things? What is, you know, environmental standards and everything like that. And so that's the challenge with the supply chain. It's so big right now that, um, you know, it just, anything goes. Yeah. And, you know, this is this is an important discussion to understand, like how to how to improve economies. Right. Because the argument that if if you in, if you increase wages, then the the company is going to move away is this old argument in order to keep wages down. And something that that labor unions have been have been campaigning against saying, like, look, we must not believe this because that way we're never going to going to going to get out of this of this uh, spiral to the bottom. And and need, we need to actually have proper labor laws, and then increase uh, bit by bit the um, the welfare of the of the population. And welfare comes first; um, uh, supplying the market comes later. And I guess this is um, this is something that even supply chain management. I mean, any company keeps in a close look on, right, in order to to make then these business decisions. Um, well, they keep. They, I mean, it depends on what their their um, consumers are asking for, and I think you know there there are um, situations where some clothing companies are looking for certifications, you know, of, of certain um, environmental standards or labor laws. But in reality, most consumers don't really pay that much attention to it. And um, I mean, it's more of a cognitive dissonance is that. When we think about you know some of the things that are happening relative to labor laws and environmental standards, it bothers us. But most consumers don't really think about it much when they're purchasing these goods. Yeah, yeah. and you know, back in the early two thousand, uh, Thomas Friedman wrote this famous book on the Earth is flat. Um, and you actually, in your book, you're saying no, the Earth is not flat at all; it's spiky. Could you maybe explain what this Friedman's notion of a flat Earth is, and why you why you say like we shouldn't think of it that way? Yeah, I think the data show for the last 20 years that um, economic growth has been spiky. Um, in fact, you know, if you look at uh, in the United States alone, um, the costs and the benefits from a consumer standpoint have been magnificent. You know, if you look at what the costs are of electronics over those years. Um, but if you look at if you break down the wages between blue collar and white collar labor, uh, blue collar labor has been flat and down while white collar labor has been up. And that's just the United States. And then you look at the benefits that have happened in other countries. Um, and you know, you don't see a what what um would lead to that multiplier effect, and that is a consistent multiplier between supply and demand. So you can't create the multiplier if you know certain parts of the population are not benefiting economically versus, you know, I mean it's it's it, the, the data just show that economic growth doesn't catch the imbalances between supply and demand. So would you, from in, in your book, you then write that, um, it, very interestingly, that supply chains can have a positive or negative impact on society, depending on how uh, they're, they're being managed. And let me quote you here for a second. You're writing, at their worst, supply chains have uh, delivered a zero-sum mentality across the planet of spiky globalization, 
what you meant, leading to the deindustrialization of inner cities and rural towns that has left entire communities behind and has commoditized the role of work in the production process. Can you maybe explain how this should be changed? How, how can supply chain management lead to a more fair and equitable uh, uh, society in within an economy and across economies? Yeah. Um, well, my th one of my favorite economists is Adam Smith. And um, I think the challenge with Adam Smith is he's often misquoted. Um, and I think um, how I look at supply chains today has become, they become too big um, because you can't create these benefits across an entire country. In fact, you can't even create them across the entire, I mean, you can't create them across the entire world or country. Um, what we need to do is look at them community by community. And um, so that way you can create these multiplier effects that have happened, you know, in certain areas over time over the last 200 years. Um, and the good news about that is that um, there's technology in place in order to enable that versus over the last couple hundred years, technology has propelled this form of globalization to continue to expand outward. And we've, ex we've exhausted that possibility. There's nowhere else to expand when it comes to you know, economic growth. The only place we can expand economic growth is instead of moving outward, it's moved back inward on a community basis. And it's important to, to make the point that, you know, some, some people I've talked to, and I mentioned, you know, community-based supply chains, you know, propelling a multiplier effect in a community is, is a pure capitalist concept, it is not a socialist concept. Um, can you, can it, you explain it? A community, because there's something you're pitching in your book, you're pitching the idea community-based supply chain. Um, what, what, what would that look like? Okay, so um, a good example is what happened in the beginning of industrialization. It was only possible for factories to be effective when public utilities were put in place for electricity, for water, for roads. So the, the public invested in infrastructure in order to grow the economy. And so if you think about that from a 20th century standpoint, how can we apply that to a 21st century standpoint? Well, we can enable certain technologies such as 3D printing and blockchain and artificial intelligence, that if public infrastructure is put in place in my hometown of Baltimore or Flint, Michigan, or one of these other rotting places that no company will invest in, this will enable individuals and entrepreneurs to not have to, to spend capital that they can't compete against the big supply chain in order to innovate and to grow demand and supply within these communities. Yeah, it's the old discussion of like infrastructure investment and is it is this done by the state or by by private entities? And the matter of the fact is this that some infrastructure projects are so huge that basically even venture capitalists just can't foot the bill. I mean you you couldn't have build railroads across the continent of America if it hadn't been a national project <laughs> with, with massive funds, right? Um, and that then creates creates demand uh, uh, across the board, right? And then that 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 creates the infrastructure that then springs from from secondary and tertiary concepts uh, uh, projects. Um, so it, it it harks back to this one, right? Public investment into public infrastructure by the state. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the other thing that it does is it brings uh, capitalist innovation back to innovators in communities, as opposed to large global supply chains really are um, benefit large multinational corporations, which I, you know, I work for a large corporation, so I understand what their goals are, but they crowd out, you know, uh, small small people can't innovate, you know, spend the capital to compete against these large supply chains. So it gives power back to individual and communities that doesn't exist today. Do you think that, especially for the United States, this would need a change in thinking, a change in, in, in politics, or is, is everything already there in order to move toward more uh, infrastructure investments politically? That's a great question. Um, it really, really what it gets down to is this debate about capitalism. And 
you know, I go back to, you know, what I really think is what's great about capitalism, especially in the United States, is it's this great equalizer where um, somebody with a great idea and hard work can compete. And I think the challenge that we face today in our supply chains in the United States and around the world is we, we just win through economies of scale. Now, the United States is an innovation-based economy. And, and in my book, I compared the United States to China, which is, which, you know, this model wouldn't work very well in China because, you know, it, it's not about individual innovation. It's about state-sponsored capitalism. So I do think that, um, you know, the other benefit to the United States here is, uh, and actually in Europe, is there's this growing digital divide between the blue collar and the white collar workers. And we continue to talk every presidential election, we talk about bringing jobs back to the United States. And we are bringing manufacturing back to the United States, but it's digital supply chains, it's automation. And so the good news is, is that that will bring you know, job creation. The bad news is we have more than half of the population who's left on the outside of it. So if we reimagine supply chain and we reimagine manufacturing and we re-educate people, you know, back in the industrial um, revolution, we had to teach people from other countries that were immigrants on how to read and write. We need to have that same education to break this digital divide, to bring all these past blue collar workers into this new economy. If we do that, there's no place in the world that would be better for this to happen is, than in the United States. And the good news is we could do it one community at a time and it would be connected as the internet, right? It could be, you know, the internet isn't like one behemoth uh, website. It's a bunch of clusters connected all over the world. So one community can create a digital supply chain based on healthcare, and one can create one that's focused on this. And then we could connect all across the planet in a way where you're both enabling um, economies of scale, and you're also enabling individuals and communities. And, you know, on this channel, I do criticize the United States quite a fair bit, but I must say, I mean, the good you're absolutely right. The U.S. is a, a fantastic innovation-based uh, economy. I love my iPhone. I love my Mac. Mm -hmm. I love a lot of the things that the United States is able to produce and has has always has been on the forefront for now 200 years. And it's it's easily forgotten that the United States was at the forefront of the development of railroads because then at some point they decided, now nah, we're not going to do that anymore. But everybody else was happy picking that up. The Europeans were very happy picking that up. And... um. So what you're foreseeing is the this moving into the digital realm, uh, and maybe maybe that this is going to be a next point of innovation also for the U.S. of digital supply chains and digital goods. Well, what I'm saying to you, Pascal, is it's our only option. Um, if you think about where these global supply chains are heading, you know we are seeing these fractures in the United States, in Europe, in Asia where you're seeing increased income inequality. Now, what the Industrial Revolution brought is it enabled a middle class, mm. right? I mean, so all of a sudden you don't have just all rich people and all factory workers, you all of a sudden grow this middle class. All across the planet, we're seeing a decline of the middle class. And so the way these uh, large supply chains work, and again, I know this as a corporate manager, is you grow through economies of scale, you grow through you know, this whole financial model that, you know, today isn't working um, to, to create equality. Equality can't be created through socialism. Equality has to be created through capitalism. So capitalism has to shift back to where it used to be, which is focused on individuals and communities. Some form of socially controlled capitalism that doesn't kill itself, but that keeps producing for everybody. Exactly, right. And so... You know, the role of government is to enable competition and to enable workers and communities, not just um, shareholders and consumers, because that's a model that eventually what we're seeing is, is coming to an end.